When it comes to religion, be willing to bet that most people are familiar with the big five, right? Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Thanks to people who sometimes come knocking on our doors, you're probably also familiar with some other religions like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Have you ever heard of Pastafarianism? The Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster started as a protest against the teaching of intelligent design in schools, but it has actually grown to a protest against religion in general, which makes it really ironic that it claims to be one of the fastest growing religions in the world. Of course, it's not just Pastafarianism. We could talk about Yeezyanity, which celebrates some sneakers that you may have heard of. There are also things like Bayism. Bayism celebrates all things Beyonce. And it's more than just a fan club. This is actually a, a group. The, the National Church of Bay is actually actively working to build a temple in the Atlanta air, area. They also have a book of scripture called the Babel, the B-E-Y-B-E-L, which is a collection of Beyonce's song lyrics because apparently finding those on the internet is not enough. Now, I don't mean to judge, but it does seem like we should make some judgments about belief systems, religions that we might consider giving our lives to. Of course, given the examples I shared and the dozens of others that you can find if you search the internet for new religions, we should probably start by asking a question in general like, what actually is religion? Like, is it a divine fan club? Or is it a human construct? Is it a spiritual enterprise or is it a psychological crutch? Is it the opiate of the masses, as Karl Marx famously said? Is religion what you do or is it what you believe? What makes a religion worthy of your time and your resources and your very life? Is any religion worth your time and your very life? What makes a religion pleasing to God? Or is any religion pleasing to God? Those are some huge questions. And there's some questions that I actually think today's passage attempts to answer. That would be James chapter 1, uh, verses 19 to 27, which I invite you to join me in. Uh, you can find that on page 1840 in most of the Bibles under your seats. Now I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler alert that when you get to James 1, what you will find James saying is this. Religion that God approves of is looking after widows and orphans and keeping oneself from being polluted by the world. Oh, if it were only that simple. <laughs> you see, it's statements like that that led a, a famous religious person, a reformer named Martin Luther. It's, it's statements like that that led Martin Luther to say that the book of James should not be included in our Bibles. Luther said that because he was afraid that James undercuts the gospel by telling us more about what we should do rather than what we believe. With all due respect, I actually think Martin Luther missed the point. So does John Calvin, another reformer who you may have heard of. John Calvin says James doesn't define religion. He simply reminds us that religion, that faith without action, is nothing. That actually is a summary of the book of James. But the whole point of the book of James is to remind us that God, who, who grants us life in Jesus Christ, calls us to follow Jesus Christ with our lives. The point of the book of James is that action should not be separated from belief. That Sunday morning, like this time right now, should be not, not be segregated from the rest of your week. That is, not unless we want to live divided lives. And I don't think anyone wants to live a divided life. James says there is a path to wholeness. There's a path to living life the way God designed you to live. There actually is a path to flourishing, to experiencing the shalom that God made us for. And the book of James takes a crack at, at, at ex expanding on that, explaining how certain actions line up with certain beliefs in the good news of Jesus Christ. What James takes a crack at today is explaining how that relates to this thing called religion. I invite you to join me in reading what James says about religion in James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. My dear brothers and sisters, 
take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so I should remind you uh, of something we talked about last week, and that is James is written within the spirit of wisdom literature. That is a a particular genre, which you will find in Scripture, uh, which aims at unpacking the daily realities of life. In other words, that guides us on wise ways of living. The thing about wisdom literature is they're full of lots of pithy statements, and they're full of lots of pictures trying to illustrate the point. Today's passage is no different, and so we're going to work through a few statements and a few pictures, but we're going to start with this bit of advice that James starts with, where he says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, this may sound like something that perhaps your mother told you growing up, or maybe some teacher told you, right, that you got, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Of course, this is about more than just doling out advice. James is actually talking about living a a, a whole life that is being shaped by the good news. And so he says that we should watch our mouths and we should watch our temper because this anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. In other words, it doesn't lead us on the right path of life that God so wants for us, a path of flourishing, a path that is within God's shalom. In other words, this is about more than just being good for goodness sake. It's about being connected to God. Of course, there's a problem with that. And James just goes right after it in verse 21. He says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Now, James is talking about sin. Sin is a common theme in Scripture because it's a common reality in our lives. He's speaking about sin, but he uses a couple of interesting words. One, he uses the word evil, to remind us that sin is a more sinister thing than just some bad habit or a lack of manners. He also uses the word filth to remind us that it isn't something that we really want in our lives. At least it shouldn't be. Of course, he also uses the word prevalent to remind us that it is the case. This is everywhere in our world. It's all over our lives. And it's why we have to not just be told to get rid of it, it's why we actually have to be trained to get rid of it. Speaking of training, it, you, you might think of this a bit like potty training. Now, there are a lot of theories out there about how to potty train your children, but one of the most common theories is to let your kids sit in their dirty diapers until they are so repulsed by their own filth that they ask to be changed. And they eventually start taking themselves to the toilet. Now, this is a strategy, perhaps you're familiar with it, that works about 99% of the time. Oh, but every now and then, you get a kid who's like, I don't know how you're feeling about this situation, but I'm good. I can do this all day. Now, I could either confirm nor deny whether or not I had a child like that in my family, But I can tell you that I'm like that, spiritually speaking. And I'd be willing to bet that you are a bit as well. That's because as much as we would like to think that we're all repulsed by our own sin, chances are we're all a little bit more comfortable with it than we like. Now granted, we're always repulsed by other people's sin, but think about what we do with our own sin at times. Do you ever excuse it? Or justify it 
downplay it? You ever say things like, well, if, if he weren't like that, I wouldn't be like this. If she didn't do that, I wouldn't have to do this. You ever think, oh, it's just a, it's just a little white lie. I'm just, oh, I just fudged the numbers just once. Oh, I just looked at this just once. I'm not as bad as that person over there. You ever do those kind of things? Of course you do. We all do it. Again, as much as we would like to think that we are repulsed by our own sin, chances are we're often more comfortable with it than we want to be. We, we, it's become so normal in so many areas that we sometimes learn to sit in it like a child in a diaper. Thankfully, there's hope for people like us. James speaks to it as he continues in verse 21. Humbly accept the word that was planted in you, which can save you. Now here's why Martin Luther got overruled and James stayed in our Bibles. James actually calls us to action, but he only does so in response to God's action. In other words, he's not saying, hey, people, clean up the filth in your life so God will pay attention to you. What he's saying is, hey, clean up the filth in your life so that you can pay attention to God. Accept what has been planted in you. The Word of God. The Spirit of God. Clean things up a bit. In fact, clean up the garden a bit, if you will, so that, that, that things might actually grow, so that you might actually bear fruit. Yes, we've moved from a potty training metaphor to a gardening metaphor. You're welcome. Seriously, I, I want us to understand the significance of this because I, I, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that James undercuts the gospel. He really is undergirding the central tenet of the gospel. That is that God does not treat us as we, th- as we deserve. He, does not, he is not repulsed by our own filth as much as he is concerned about it. He actually acts on our behalf. He actually saves us. He actually plants his word within us. He actually dwells with us. And so when James is speaking here, he's not just going after sin and condemning everyone around him. In fact, he's inviting the people who believe the good news to wake up to it, to respond to what God has already started in our lives, and to make room for the sanctifying work of God as the Spirit of God bears fruit in keeping with the Word of God. Now, so that you don't think I'm just making this up, let's just pause for a minute and and notice who James is writing to. It's the beginning of Dave's passage today, verse 19, you'll see it. If you look up at the top of the letter, remember this is a letter in verse 2, you'll see exactly who he's writing to. Brothers and sisters. In other words, people who have been engrafted into his family. People who have been engrafted together in God's family. People who aren't asking the question, how do I be saved? People who have been saved in Christ and who are saying, what happens now? James is not saying, do this so that God will pay attention to you. He's saying, do this because God has poured his spirit into you. Clean up the filth so you can pay attention to God. Let this cooperate with the Spirit of God so that He might clean up the garden and bear fruit in keeping with the good news. The question is, how do you actually do that? Well, James says you do what God says. In fact, he says this explicitly in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. It says if you claim to believe this, but you don't do anything with it, you're, just, you're fooling yourself. You don't really believe it. He says, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit crazy to say that I believe it and not do it. In fact, he uses another picture here. He says that's like a person who looks in the mirror and immediately forgets what they look like. Now, I know some of us like to forget what we look like the older we get, Right? Seriously, you don't do that. You know what you look like. We all spend time in front of the mirror, and you know exactly what you look like. James says, for, for, for you to claim to believe but not to do what you believe is, is, is as foolish as that. It doesn't make sense. And he isn't talking about ignorance. He's just talking about flat-out disobedience. And we know this because the word that James uses, the word look, does it mean to casually scroll through things like you're thumbing through a newspaper or scrolling through your feed on social media? It means to look intently, to study, to investigate. 
In fact, the same word look that is used in verse 22 is the same one he uses in verse 25, which literally is translated look intently. It, It means to explore, to really analyze yourself in the mirror. James says not doing what the word says, forgetting what you look like, this act of disobedience is really a picture of someone who just blocks out the word of God. Who justifies our behavior. Who, who ignores the, the, the pricking of their conscience. Who, who rejects the counsel of others. Long story short, it isn't a very pretty picture. Oh, but thankfully James continues. But, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, this is really good news, but this is also where things can get a bit confusing for a couple of reasons. First of all, James switches terms. He goes from talking about the Word to talking about the law. Don't be confused. They are basically synonymous here. In fact, you might think of it along the idea of the Ten Commandments. Those are actually the ten words, literally in Scripture. Word and law are synonymous. Of course, the bigger thing that that might cause confusion is the fact that James talks about the law that gives freedom. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that is not what most people think of. Freedom, that is, is not what most people think of when they think of the law. Is that the first thing that pops in your mind when I say the word law? I mean, laws tend to tell us what what we need to do. You know, like pay our taxes. And things that we can't do, like rob a bank to pay our taxes. (laughs) Laws are generally good things, especially when other people keep them. But laws don't tend to ring of freedom when we think about us keeping them. How in the world can James be talking about a perfect law that gives freedom? Well, he's talking about God's law, which, yes, human laws are based on, but God law, God's law is a bit different because God's law isn't really a set of do's and don'ts. It's like Julie was saying earlier. It's not just don't do these things. God's law is actually an invitation into a different way of life. Actually, it's an invitation into the way of life that we all long for deep down, even if we can't quite figure it out. God's law is a, is a path to blessing. God's law is meant to lead us to flourishing, to shalom, to living whole lives. God's law is not a burden in the way that we often think of laws. It's just that we often tend to turn it into a burden. You know, I got a really interesting example of this a number of years ago. I was taught this lesson by my health insurance provider. What happened is my health insurance provider decided that they would try to be more proactive with health care. And my my insurance provider started providing incentives for people to do things that lead to a healthier lifestyle. Like my insurance company literally paid me to get an annual physical. They literally paid me to watch a whole bunch of really boring health videos online. And they paid me to wear a pedometer, a Fitbit. Now, how many of you guys have a pedometer? How many of you, anyone wearing an Apple Watch or you got something, or you track it on your phone the old-fashioned way? Yeah, pedometers are pretty, uh, are, are pretty popular, and they're pretty stylish. There are some cool Apple Watches. I, none of them. My pedometer looked like this. My pedometer was the prototype of pedometers. It was this clunky thing that I had to wear on my belt like a, a bad cell phone holster or like a pager, if you know what that is. It was terrible, but you know what? I wore that thing because my health insurance company paid me to wear it, and I wore it all the time. I even slept with it on because my health insurance company said they would pay me even more if I could outwalk other people in my network. Now, I'm not sure how they did this, but they grouped us into settings and they would track walkers each month. And the people who walked the most each month got a bonus check in the mail. Now, this is a great idea, but it's a significant problem if you're seriously competitive and you're living in a seriously expensive city on a pastor's salary. Long story short, I went crazy with this. Like seriously, I got obsessed with it. I took the stairs everywhere, which is not a bad idea. I took the long way home 
I paced when I was at home. I paced in the line in the grocery store. I took my dog on late night walks just to get some extra steps in. My dog hated me. And you know what? I swore that everyone else in my network was cheating because there is no way they were getting that many steps in. I got crazy about this. I mean, seriously, I literally went crazy about this until, thanks be to God, God saved me from it. God killed my Fitbit. (laughs) I'm serious. It wasn't the battery. I know this because I replaced them immediately. I didn't want to miss any steps. My Fitbit just died one day. There is no earthly explanation for it. The hand of God, the grace of God in my life. And my point is that this incentive program was a really good idea. It actually is good to be proactive about your health. It just became an enormous burden. And it wasn't meant to be a burden. In fact, it wasn't the health insurance, uh, you know, my health insurance provider's intention to make it a burden. I'm the one who turned it into a burden because I went crazy with it. It was only after God killed my Fitbit and kind of restored my sanity that I recognized this. It was then that I realized that I, I, I walked because I wanted to walk, not because I felt like I had to. It was only then that I actually was free to actually pursue a healthy lifestyle, both physically and mentally. I think it's, that's a bit like what James is talking about here. I think it's actually a fitting metaphor for what we often do with the law. God's law is not meant to be this burdensome, restrictive set of do's and don'ts that drives you crazy and makes all your neighbors mad at you. It's actually meant to be a healthy way to be proactive in living the life that God calls us to live, in pursuing shalom, in actually experiencing the fullness of God's blessing in our lives. In fact, imagine this, if you will. Imagine what your life would be like if you actually lived according to God's law. Would some things be harder? Yeah. Would you be called to sacrifice? Yes. But could you imagine the relationships that you would have? Can you imagine being freed from your tight grip on your things? Can you imagine what the world would be like if everyone did that? I can't. It's actually the way the story ends. But that's what God's law is meant to be. Not a burden, but a path to blessing. A path for us to live according to the ways that God has designed the world to live. Again, because that's easier said than done, because we actually have to talk about how to apply it, James gets pretty specific in saying, okay, let's talk about actually how to apply that in a few areas. Now, he does say in verse 26, once again, that we should watch what we say with our mouths. We're not going to spend time on that today, even though this is clearly an important point. He's mentioned it twice in today's passage. We're going to save this for a couple of weeks because when James gets to chapter 3, he actually spends almost an entire chapter talking about the ways that we can bless and curse with our mouths. And so we'll save that conversation for a few weeks from now. But since we started by talking about religion, we're going to jump to verse 27 now. Where James says, let's talk about how to apply this in this thing called religion, which again, is quite common in our world, but also can be a bit confusing. James says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and spotless as this. To look after orphans and widows, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James says, okay, here, here are two specific examples to put, of how you can put the gospel in action. Here are two ways to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. Look after widows and orphans and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. It's a good summary of it. You might think of it as guarding your heart and guarding the dignity of others. In fact, let's talk about it in those terms. Let's do it in that order. Guarding your heart and guarding the dignity of others. It starts with guarding your heart. What's better than getting rid of all the filth in your life? Not letting any filth in to begin with about being very deliberate about the things that you choose to do and the, choose, the things that you choose to let influence your life. Of course, it's easier said than done. But the good news is that God blesses us with His Spirit. He actually, God dwells in us by His Spirit. He has planted the Word in us, and in, there is the ability to actually cooperate with the Spirit in application of the Word. 
To not just be forgiven of our sins, but actually to pursue a path that doesn't lead us down a path of sin, that actually leads us down a path of surrender. The key thing is we have to learn to listen to the leading of the Spirit. You know, we've talked a lot this past year about spiritual formation because we think that's what it means to listen to the Spirit. And we've created classes to help facilitate this, but don't mistake classes for spiritual formation. It's a part of it, but it's not the sum total of it. Spiritual formation is anything you do to listen to the Spirit of God, which I think is actually really helpfully done in community. But it also begins when you're sitting alone with God. What are you doing in this season to listen to the voice of God? To follow the lead of the Spirit? What's your prayer life look like right now? Are you opening Scripture? Again, not just when you show up and I tell you what page to turn to, but regularly? Are you interacting with other people inside or outside of a class or a small group or some, some formalized gathering in a way that allows you to actually wrestle with these things? I don't ask you that to make you feel guilty. I just ask you that to invite you to consider maybe a better path of life. A one, that will, one that will cost you something, but also, too, might lead you down a path of blessing. That's the first thing. Guarding your heart. Being mindful of what you let in with the help of God's Spirit. And yes, the help of God's people. The second thing that, that James says is, is that we would watch out for widows and orphans in their distress. Now, if you're wondering why James is mentioning widows and orphans in particular, it's because they were the epitome of vulnerability in the first century world. Women had little to no opportunities to work in the first century. And so marriage was a path to being cared for. The problem is, if your husband died, you lost pretty much any, any chance of income. There were a few opportunities unless you wanted to sell yourself, which is not a path of flourishing. Women had little to no rights or opportunities outside of marriage. As for orphans, it was a similar path. I mean, children were kind of highly disregarded in the ancient world. They were really helpful for helping out around the farm or taking care of the flock, right? It's why you had lots of kids, right? Especially in case you lost one. But if there's no farm to take care of because there are no parents around, then those kids have little to no value. And so the first century world, particularly the Roman world, which James is writing to, children were often left to themselves. They had little to no value. But what Scripture reminds us over and over again, and those are the exact kind of people that God looks out for. Those who are the most vulnerable. Those who are most on the outside looking in. And what James is saying here in chapter 1 is that God's people are to do what God does. We or to look out for those who are most vulnerable. Which absolutely still includes widows and orphans, but it also, the application is, much, is, is more broad than that. It includes anyone who is in a vulnerable state. Which would include refugees, people who are fleeing violence. It's why we're partnering with Welcome Corps. It includes unhoused neighbors. It's why we've been talking about it this past year. It's why many of our partners are seeking to address homelessness. Of course, it includes any number of things. Those who face food insecurity. Those who battle addiction. Those who are facing dementia. Those who would be in sexual minorities. It includes a whole host of things that exist right outside our doors and also right inside our doors. James says the religion that God approves of is to care for those who are most vulnerable, those who are in need. You don't have to agree with everything about those who are in need, but the call is to love those who are in need, to care for those who are in need, to do what God does. To not be repulsed by our sin, but actually to love others, even in the midst of sin. And together, Look to the God who not only forgives us of our sin, but actually leads us on a path away from it and into flourishing in the gospel.
So the question here is, what are you doing to care for the vulnerable? Those who are on the outside looking in. What are you doing with the gifts that God has blessed you with? The resources that God has blessed you with? And the community that God has called you to? What are you doing? What are we doing? Again, I don't ask this to make you feel guilty. I ask you this to help us to imagine a better way of life. Which I know that many of us are practicing. I think we collectively are practicing, but I I want to invite you to find your place in the midst of it. Friends, the invitation here is not to a list of do's and don'ts. It, it, it's not to a, a path of, of religion which we compare ourselves to others or use our faith as a, a way of justifying our sins or condemning others for theirs. But it's a path of religion that is a way of life that is in surrender to the will of God. That listens for the voice of God. and It bears witness to us by the laying down of our lives. That's the path of wholeness. That's what it means to be a doer of the word. May we hear what God is saying to us, individually and collectively. May we rejoice in the good news, which is for all of us in Christ Jesus, and with the help of God's Spirit. And in community, in this place called Kelsey Creek Church, might we do what God says and thereby might we, might we be blessed. So we might bless the world. Would you pray with me?